Good afternoon. My name is uh, Osama Burshid, O-S-A-M-A, -A. last name is A-B-U-I-R-S-H-A-I-D. I'm the executive director for the American Muslims for Palestine. I would like to thank all of you for joining us uh, today. Mainly, I would like to thank our speakers, many of whom are victims of Israel abuse and brutality, despite the fact that they are American citizens. Also, I would like to thank uh, congressional staffers who took the time to join us for this important briefing. For more than 40 years, international and American human rights organizations have been documenting discriminatory treatment by Israeli authorities of U.S. citizens. U.S. citizens entering Israel or the occupied, occupied Palestinian territories have reported being physically abused, detained for hours of humiliating questioning, strip searched, denied entry, and forced to buy plane tickets back to the U.S. Worse of all, Israeli forces have killed or gravely injured U.S. citizens. Today, Israel continues to mistreat Americans from all backgrounds who are critical of its colonial policies with impunity. Neither successive Amer the successive American administrations nor Congress has ever taken a serious look at this Israeli abusive behavior. Unfortunately, the Israeli crimes against American citizens never had any ramifications on the bilateral relations. Thus, Israel never hesitates to show its disrespect to, um, for America and Americans. Let me put this in perspective. The United States gives Israel $3.8 billion annually in military aid. The, America, the, America, the American support is what guarantees and guaranteed for decades Israel's prosperity and military superiority over, over all of its enemies in the region. In fact, the American support diplomatically and militarily is what enables Israel to continue its illegal and immoral subjugation and occupation of Palestinians and their lands. The irony here is that the annual $3.8 billion in military aid to Israel come, comes from average Americans, like us, the taxpayers. And we are the same citizens, the same people who give this $3.8 billion a year. We are the same people who are being abused by the state that we give the money to. It is time for our government and elected officials to defend American citizens. They should put America first. And America first means America first, not what President Donald Trump means by it. It should never be accepted from them to remain silent vis-a-vis -vis Israeli transgressions against Americans and citizens. Israel claims to be our, an, an ally of the U.S. while it shows no respect for this alliance. This document of proof of nationality should mean something to, our US, to, to, to the U.S. officials first before it means anything to Israel. If this National, if, this, if this document of proof of, nati of, of nationality means nothing to our government, then don't blame the Israelis for not respecting this passport. It is because our elected officials, it is because our government will not hold Israel accountable for its abuses, accountable for its brutality, accountable for its disrespect against America and American citizens. Israel has no right to punish any Americans for exercising rights here at home that are protected by the Constitution. We have every right to advocate for BDS. We have every right to speak against the Israeli mistreatment of Americans and the Israeli brutal policies against the Palestinians. We have every right to speak against the Israeli, Israel's illegal occupation of Palestine and Arab lands. If our elected officials, if our gov government abandon this responsibility, then they are doing a great disservice to this country. Finally, this briefing is a call to preserve the U.S. reputation and interests. 
It is a call to protect American citizens against the abuses of a state that claims to be our ally while showing no sign of respect for this alleged alliance. Now I would like to introduce Mr. Josh Rubner to present our policy paper titled Israel, Israel's Treat Treatment of U.S. Citizens, Case Studies and Policy Recommendations. Josh Rubner is the author of uh, Shattered Hopes, Obama's Failure to, uh, failure to Broker Israeli-Palestinian Peace, and he's the author of, the, of Israel, Democracy or Apartheid State. He's a former policy director at the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights and former analyst in Middle East Affairs at Congressional Research Service. Mr. Josh, please, if you can come to the floor. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Dr. Osama. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. And thank you all for coming to this important briefing that is examining Israel's abuse of U.S. citizens, which is, of course, just a tiny fraction of Israel's overall abuse of the Palestinian people. As I was doing the research and writing for this policy paper, I was struck by a pattern that is pervasive throughout the cases that are examined in this document. And that is when Israel commits an egregious act against a U.S. citizen, whether it's the killing of a U.S. citizen, as you'll hear from Maria, or whether it's the grave injuring of a U.S. citizen, as you'll hear from Brian, or whether Americans are mistreated by being denied entry on discriminatory terms based on their religion, based on their nationality, based on their ethnicity, based on their political viewpoint, as you'll hear from Emily. The pattern that we hear from the State Department and successive administrations, regardless of which party is in the Oval Office, is in essence the exact same. We defer to Israel's investigations of these incidents. We are not going to presume that Israel is not able to hold itself accountable. And even when we demand that Israel hold an impartial and credible investigation into these events, and Israel fails to do so, the pattern still is to defer and to not press for accountability and not to press for a U.S. investigation into these incidents. Notwithstanding the fact that some members of Congress <coughs> have provided important constituent services to their constituents who have been injured or killed or abused by Israel, but these constituent services do not take the place of true accountability. These constituent services do not stand by for holding Israel accountable and making sure that U.S. laws are followed when these violations occur. So we make some policy recommendations in this policy paper that are quite moderate. It's for the U.S. to follow its own laws. No more, no less. When a U.S. citizen is killed or injured by Israel, the United States must investigate, as it does in other cases of U.S. citizens being harmed by a foreign government, not defer to Israel. When U.S. military aid, when U.S. weapons to Israel are used to injure and kill U.S. citizens, and we know the name of the military unit that's responsible and in many cases, we know the names of the individual soldiers responsible for these human rights abuses. We have an obligation under U.S. law to ensure that the Arms Export Control Act is upheld, that the Leahy laws are upheld, that the Foreign Assistance Act are upheld, and that the Global Magnitsky Act are upheld. 
all of which require the sanctioning of individuals and military units that commit gross human rights violations against U.S. citizens or non-U.S. citizens. This is the very least that we can do. And as Israel, decade after decade, discriminates against U.S. citizens who try to enter to visit relatives, to attend family occasions and celebrations and even funerals and are denied entry, as we document in this policy paper, not only does Israel continue this discrimination, but Israel is trying to get into the visa waiver program, which would allow its citizens visa-free entry to the United States, but only in exchange for reciprocal treatment of U.S. citizens. Israel does not belong in this program as long as this type of discrimination continues. So these are some of the policy recommendations that we make in this policy paper. We hope that you'll take a look at this policy paper, bring it back to your bosses on Capitol Hill to take action on these issues. And again, I'd like to thank you for attending, and I'm going to turn it over to Jamal Najab, Director of Government Relations at American Muslims for Palestine. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Good afternoon. Uh, now you will hear from five U.S. citizens who have been abused by the Israeli authorities. But before we do that, we're going to have Maria Lahoud say a few words, a summary of what we're talking about. Maria Lahoud is a deputy legal director at the Center for Constitutional Rights with expertise in constitutional rights and international human rights. Thank you very much to AMP for organizing and thanks to all of you for being here. I'm not actually going to summarize what we're, gonna, what we're talking about. I'm going to talk specifically about two United States human rights defenders, um, Rachel Corey and Furkan Dogan, two people who were killed by Israel. I have been involved in their cases. Um, the United States government has not only failed to seek accountability, but has actually impeded it. Rachel Corey was a 23-year-old peace activist and a senior at Evergreen State College in, in Olympia, Washington. She went to Gaza with the International Solidarity Movement, volunteers from around the world who stand alongside Palestinians when they walk to and from school or tend to their olive groves, when their homes are being demolished in violation of international law, or when they're otherwise subject to harassment and attacks. On March 16, 2003, Rachel was in Rafah, Gaza, where the Israel Defense Forces was demolishing homes to clear the way for a buffer zone and the illegal wall along Gaza's border with Egypt. Wearing a bright orange fluorescent jacket, Rachel stood in front of the Nasrallah family's home where she had recently been staying to protect it from demolition while the family was inside. As two soldiers and a Caterpillar D9 bulldozer approached, Rachel began waving her arms. Other ISM members all of whom were within meters of the bulldozer, were running, jumping, and waving their arms, yelling at them to stop. The bulldozer ran over Rachel with its blade down, bearing and crushing her beneath its blade. It then backed up, still with its blade down, driving over her again, killing her. The State Department called on Israel to conduct an immediate and full investigation into Rachel's death. But Israel's investigation, even according to the State Department, was not thorough, credible, and transparent, as promised by then Prime Minister Ariel Sharon. Israel's report contained multiple factual errors, failed to include the testimony of Palestinian eyewitnesses, and selectively incorporated the testimony of international eyewitnesses. The military police investi investigator testified that he never visited the site where Rachel was killed and never questioned the bulldozer operator about IDF regulations forbidding D9 bulldozer operations near civilians. He also testified that while he was interviewing the bulldozer operator, the operator's commander interrupted to inform them that the head of the IDF Southern Command had issued an, or an order to not cooperate with the investigation. <clears throat> the State Department's country reports on human rights practices have systematically excluded the State Department's own analysis of Israel's failure to perform a credible investigation into Rachel's killing. The Corey family's congressional representative introduced a resolution to call on the U.S. to undertake an investigation into Rachel's killing, but it was never brought to a vote. State Department officials determined that the circumstances of Rachel's killing did not occasion a Leahy Amendment investigation. The support the Coreys received from our government was nominal, and they were ultimately left on their own to, seek, to secure accountability, or to try to. 
In 2005, the Center for Constitutional Rights brought a case against Caterpillar on behalf of Rachel's parents, Cindy and Craig Corey, and four Palestinian families whose, whose family members were killed or injured when their homes were demolished on top of them. Caterpillar has been selling bulldozers to Israel since 1967, and since that time, Israel has demolished nearly 50,000 Palestinian homes and other structures in violation of international law. We argued that Caterpillar aided and abetted Israel's war crimes by selling D9 bulldozers to the IDF, knowing they would be used to unlawfully demolish homes in the occupied Palestinian territory. The U.S. government submitted a brief in a case brought by their own citizen and appeared in court, asserting that it paid for the bulldozers at issue through foreign military financing aid to Israel, and arguing that the case shouldn't be heard because it would interfere with U.S. foreign policy because the U.S. wanted to encourage such sales to foreign states. The appellate court complied, finding that it did not have jurisdiction to decide the case because adjudication would intrude upon the U.S. executive's foreign policy decisions. In the Corey's case against the State of Israel, the Israeli Supreme Court ignored international law and applied Israeli law, which provides that Israel is not liable for damages from an act caused by any so-called war activity of the Israel Defense Forces. It found that Israel was immune because clearing the area was considered a war activity. Just this Monday, Israel forces reportedly demolished 70 homes in Sur Bahar, including with Caterpillar bulldozers, claiming they were too close to the wall. As Amnesty International said, the truth is that for decades, Israel's authorities have taken arbitrary and disproportionate measures in the name of security to expand their control over Palestinian land and push Palestinians out of areas they consider strategic, forcibly displacing entire communities and unlawfully destroying tens of thousands of homes. Furkan Doan was an American citizen, 18, year old, 18 years old, born in Troy, New York. In 2010, the summer before Furkan planned to start medical school, he asked his parents if he could participate in the Gaza Freedom Flotilla to deliver humani humanitarian aid to Palestinians to alleviate their suffering due to the Israeli blockade of Gaza. Proud of Furkan, his parents reluctantly, reluctantly let him go. The Gaza Freedom Flotilla was made up of six civilian vessels carrying more than 700 passengers from almost 40 countries and humanitarian aid including rebuilding supplies for delivery to the people of Gaza. At 4 a.m. on May 31, 2010, the Israel Defense Forces unlawfully intercepted and attacked the flotilla while it was sailing in international waters in the Mediterranean Sea. The IDF's attack on the Mavi Marmara killed 10 passengers, including Furkan Doan. Fifteen other U.S. citizens participated in the flotilla, including five were on, who were on a U.S. registered boat, several of whom were beaten, injured, and detained, and had their property taken and never returned. According to an investigation by the United Nations Human Rights Council, <laughs> Furkan Doan was filming a small, with a small video camera when he was first hit with live fire. He was lying on the deck in a conscious or semi-conscious state for some time. In total, Furkan received five bullet wounds. All of the entry wounds were on the back of his body except for the face wound, which entered to the right of his nose. According to forensic analysis, tattooing around the wound in his face indicates that the shot was delivered at point-blank range. The Human Rights Council concluded that Israeli forces carried out extra-legal, arbitrary, and summary executions prohibited by international human rights law against Furkan and at least five others on the flotilla. The U.S. government has never acknowledged these findings. CCR brought a Freedom of Information Act case seeking documents from eight U.S. executive branch departments and agencies related to the U.S. government's knowledge of the flotilla attack and any actions it took in response. The U.S. government's internal documents show that it engaged in diplomatic efforts to stymie the fact-finding mission of the U.N. Human Rights Council and opposed the Human Rights Council resolution welcoming the mission's report. This is about the killing of a U.S. citizen. Instead of supporting the international investigation, the U.S. backed Israel's internal inquiry, which exonerated the Israeli soldiers involved in the attack and concluded that their actions were legal and failed to provide any details regarding Furkan's killing. The 2010 State Department Human Rights Country Report did not name Furkan Doan or even mention that a U.S. citizen had been killed in the flotilla. The U.S. has never called for accountability for Furkan's killing. On the contrary, the, Senate, the U.S. Senate passed a resolution, quote, to express the sense of the Senate that Israel has an undeniable right to self-defense and to condemn the recent destabilizing actions by extremists aboard the ship Mavi Marmara. The House of Representatives introduced a series of bills and resolutions conveying similar sentiments. 
Farrakhan's parents brought a federal case in California against Ehud Barak, the then Israeli Minister of Defense, for overseeing the IDF attack on the flotilla that resulted in Farrakhan's extrajudicial killing. The State of Israel requested that the Department of State file a suggestion of immunity on behalf of Barak, and the Department of State did so, determining that Barak was immune from suit and arguing that the court must defer to that determination and dismiss the case. Again, a case brought by the family of a U.S. citizen seeking accountability. The district court followed the executive branch's suggestion of immunity and dismissed the case to avoid embarrassing the executive branch by assuming an antagonistic, antagonistic jurisdiction and to afford the political branches the much needed discretion to resolve the issue through diplomacy. The Doans appealed to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. We have filed an amicus brief arguing that the former Israeli official does not deserve immunity. And the US government filed an amicus brief arguing that the State Department's determination of immunity are controlling. They participated in oral argument, which was in April, and there's still no decision yet. Meanwhile, Israel continues to impose a closure on Gaza that effectively cuts off approximately two million Palestinians from the rest of the world. Palestinians have been protesting in Gaza every Friday for more than a year in the Great March of Return, at which Israel has fatally shot 207 protesters, including 44 children, and wounded more than 12,000. Israel's attacks on United States human rights offenders must be seen in this larger context of its attacks on Palestinians and occupation of Palestine. Human rights defenders like Palestinians are maligned, condemned, denied entry, deported, criminalized, injured, and even killed. There's no recourse from the U.S. government even when the targets are U.S. citizens. Rachel and Furkan paid the ultimate price in standing up against oppression, violence, and injustice. May each of us have even a fraction of the courage and compassion of Rachel and Furkan, and the love, conviction, and persistence of their families in seeking accountability for their killings. As Rachel Corey said, we should be inspired by people who show that human beings can be kind, brave, generous, beautiful, strong, even in the most difficult circumstances. I want to thank the 17 brave members of Congress who voted against House Resolution 246 yesterday, who refused to put the interests of a foreign country above the interests of the rights of U.S. citizens, who refused to put power and politics above human rights and free speech. The U.S. government has taken the side of a foreign country, Israel, over the rights of its own citizens again and again, just as Congress did last night in, in House Resolution 246, chilling Americans' rights to engage in boycott, divestment, and sanctions to uphold international law and human rights. Americans are increasingly heeding the call to BDS because the United States government provides unconditional political, diplomatic, economic, and military support for Israel, despite Israel's violations of international law. Rather than continuing to defend Israel's impunity at all costs, the U.S. government must end its own complicity in Israel's violations and stand with equality, freedom, and justice. I asked Cindy Corey, Rachel's mom, if she'd like to, to say anything, and she sent me this. After all these years, what feels so troubling is the total disregard that so many in Congress continue to have for Palestinian lives and for all that Palestinians have suffered for so long and for Gaza. The broad lack of concern for Palestinian rights among our leaders and now their attacks on those of us who spend our lives working for a just peace and for equality, freedom, security, and opportunity for all in the region is an enormous disappointment, disservice, and impediment to peace. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. Uh, we're going to divert a little bit from the regular schedule. Uh, we have an honored guest here with us, and I'd like to ask her to come up and say a few words, and that is Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib. Get in. Not a problem. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much 
Hi, everyone. Ahlan wa sahlan. Um, thank you all so much for being here. I'm so happy that you're doing the policy briefing. Uh, one of the things that I, um, being only here for the short seven months, I think it's a critically important to increase our presence um, in talking about the impact uh, of people like my mother, who is now in Palestine, that had to travel through Jordan to get to come and see her living grandmother in the West Bank. Um, but it is, the reality is that... Um, even though we have, uh, you know, I believe we currently have a visa waiver program between Israel and, and the United States, um, that we're not actually taking a closer lens and looking at the fact that many are being denied access through Tel Aviv and being forced to use entryway through Jordan. That happens to my mother every single uh, time. She was uh, born in Palestine when she came to the United States. At that time, they didn't have what they call the, the Hawiya or the Palestinian Authority didn't exist at the time, so she never had um, the Palestinian residency. Uh, the green passport. We're always, you know, in Palestine, it's always the colors. Um, but the 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 interesting thing is, you know, when my grandfather was dying and she she had he had land, she went and applied for it so that she can own the land, right? Um, and we've heard some of our stories. And when we look at the case studies and kind of deep a deeper dive, I think it's important to show that um, the same reason why we have, I think, dual citizenship and why we have this kind of um, uh, shared, uh, you know, relationship, and when we say, okay, hey, State Department, go ahead and approve a visa waiver program, is that it's done in good faith, and that it's done in a way that a certain percentage of Americans cannot be denied entry. Well, I got to tell you, when Americans, like my mother, is denied entry through Tel Aviv and has to be forced through Jordan, that should be counted as a denial, because it's segregation. Um, people say to me, they go through Tel Aviv now to the Ben-Goran airport, and they hardly see Palestinians there, and I think that's very intentional. Um, I think the fact that we're, they're pushing and forcing people to go through certain entryway into Israel, um, and, it, and it has nothing to do with security. These are American United, I mean, United States citizens. My mother has been a citizen for over 30 years, and she has to go, and she does not like to, has to go through a different, govern, a diff a different country and go through um, paying extra cost in traveling. Um, it li literally takes a day or so to get through, and she has to go through yet another layer of security and scrutiny and so forth to get to go see her mother in the West Bank. And so I think the State Department in our country needs to take a closer look at to that. Um, it is a critically, critically important. And many of these American citizens are just everyday. Everyday Palestinians have been here for years, some two generations, and they're, sit they're getting continually denied access. Um, uh, and, and I truly believe it's based on uh, it's very racialized and it's based on racism and may or may not folks understand that but it's very very much true I remember being t I think it was 12 years old I don't know if you know Jamal this story 12 years old and you know I grew up in the most beautiful blackest city in the in, in the country in the city of Detroit and most of my teachers were African-American women that taught me about the pain of oppression, segregation. And even uh, I remember one teacher showing me like a place where her uncle was, I think, wa wa you know, literally with the fire hose from the Detroit Fire Department at the time when he was protesting um, discrimination and inequality. And so when I'm at 12 years old going with my mother to Palestine because my uncle was getting married, we took 13 suitcases, if you can believe that. Yeah. My mom, Jabit Mahabashkir, I said, Mama, they have towels in Palestine. You know our parents do that. So, but so it's so funny, Jamal. And, but my mother, that's how she was. You know, she grew up very, very humble background, very poor in a farming community in Betor el Foca, and so in a farming village. And so when we went there, I remember, remember vividly, my mother went in one line and the rest went out. And she at that time was not a Palestinian resident. She was just a United States citizen. And she was in one line. And I looked at the line. It was all the Palestinians in one line and all of the Israelis in one line. And I didn't see any uh, uh, what I would call Palestinian uh, citizens, uh, 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 Israel, or Palestinians who are Israeli citizens. And you could see right away. And I was like, Mama, why are we in this long line? Why are we in this line where everybody looks like afraid? Uh, and and in, uh, the other line was moving so quickly, moving moving just fast. And I just caught that and said, oh my God, this is what my teachers taught me about what happened to blacks in America. Mm -hmm. And so I can't take away that lens. People don't like it when I say that, that that's what I feel like is happening. But that's my lens. Write about it. You want to take it, but don't take it out of the context of the fact that, yes, this is a form of othering. 
This is a form of dehumanization, especially when we want to say, well, some Americans deserve less rights because they're of Palestinian descent and others don't. I think that's wrong. And we need to push back against those kinds of racist policies in Israel, period. And so I just really thank all of you for being here. I want to encourage all of you, many of you are in different organizations, please be more present here and be more um, aware that when you use words like occupation, my colleagues don't know what you're talking about. When you say one to two state, they don't know what you're talking about. I had a colleague ask me what the blockade in Gaza means. These are not bad people. They really want to do the right thing. So many of them ask me so many thoughtful questions. I think, alhamdulillah, I'm here because I do have an openness. I don't take it offense. And I look at my smile, I was like, thank you for asking me. This is what it is. Another person actually signed on to the anti-BDS, not really understanding, but because they saw so many colleagues on there, they said it must be important. So I want you to know this is a tremendous opportunity for our cause, for human rights. That's going to make Israelis safer too. It's not just about us. It's about the whole country. And I got to tell you, they're waiting for you to talk to them. They're waiting for you to teach them. And I always use the example of Humans of New York where they describe the human impact. By the time you're done, you're like, oh my God, that's what it means. But when you start starting, and now these are for my uncles and aunties that start with since 1948, don't do that to us. Don't do that to my colleagues. This is the largest incoming class since Watergate, ironically. Um, and they're diverse. Many have never held office before. They never truly understand you know, some of the foreign kind of relationships. This is so intimate to us that it's second nature to say, I support this, self-determination. Jama'ah, they don't know what it is. So pull back a little bit. Talk about you first, your personal. I always tell them, my grandmother lives there. She's a, all she cares about is if her chickens are actually like getting eggs. If there's not enough eggs, she's upset. <laughs> but you know what she cares about? She cares about if, if one day when she's sick, she wants to go to Jerusalem at the better hospital. No offense to her mom. That's what she cares about, is not having to go through a checkpoint, not having to worry about whether or not my uncle comes home or if he's going to get detained or imprisoned. That's what she cares about. It's those everyday kinds of challenges that we're taking for granted and not sharing because we're too busy trying to fix it. But we're not going to be able to fix it until you try to look at the human impact first. Try not to react. They're trying to have me react. They're trying to twist my words. I won't react. I will always come from a place of love, from a place for humanity and equality. That's what Detroit taught me, and I'm not going to waver from that. You all shouldn't waver from it as well. So thank you all so much for being here. I just found out. Is this on there? I just found out this is Rashida's birthday. Today's her birthday. Let's sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Rashida. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, I'm so honored because I also shared the birthday of Detroit. I don't know if you all know that, ironically. Um, but also the inside joke in my office is probably going to hit the headlines. I don't care. They're like, oh, my God, Mueller is testifying on your birthday. I said, well, I hope, <laughs> hope there's a present in there somewhere. Um, because there has to, has to be, for the love of justice, be some sort of endless to this lawless presidency. But I, I do want to thank you all. That was very, very beautiful. Thank you. And especially being away from my family. I'm the eldest of 14. They're all waiting to, to you know, tease me um, for the fact that so many people still think I'm in my 30s. I am 43 today. Very wow. proud of my age. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, let's continue with the program. Uh, next, we hear from Brian Avery, and he will tell you his story. Brian Avery is an award-winning musical recording artist based out of Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. Tell us your story, sir. Um, thanks everybody for coming out today. I thank all AMP and Josh and all the organizers. Um, this is really good. 
Um, so the basic idea is that in 2003, I joined what was called the International Solidarity Movement. It was a volunteer, basically a volunteer movement of people. No one signed any contracts. No one was employed. It was people who were willing to practice what they call in political science public diplomacy, which is when you feel that the sort of existing structures aren't doing enough, that you as a citizen, as the taxpayer, that is funding a country like Israel, you, you have the, the sort of responsible privilege to take it upon yourself. And, and so that's what folks were doing, to go, to document, to report, um, to provide humanitarian assistance as much as possible. And, and that's what we did. Um, you know, when I was there, you know, I'd studied the conflict for a long time. I grew up in a military family. My dad was always traveling around the world. So I took an interest in world politics to study and understand. Um, Israel was certainly, Palestine was certainly one of those, one of those topics. So by the time I went, um, you know, there's this myth of these sort of naive young peace activists, and it was, you know, very much the opposite. Everybody there was very dedicated, very conscious of what the situation involved, the dangers involved. Um, you know, we weren't just walking in blind. So this was a very, you know, studied you know, an effort by very smart people to do a very risky thing, to go out of their comfort zone, because we, we care. We care about, you know, doing good, trying to improve, you know, the situations around the world in any way we can as, you know, representatives of our nation, our government. Um, and so I was there for about three and a half, four months. Um, there's, a, there's another sort of trope that people like to throw out to say, well, uh, you shouldn't have been there, um, this and that, you were illegally there. And if that was true, they could have at any time, you know, politely bundled me up into a Jeep, taken me to the airport, and sent me on home. Um, I interacted with soldiers on an almost daily basis. Uh, the soldiers had actually shot me in the face. I probably interacted with them in person the day before. They knew who we were, they knew what we were doing, they knew we were no threat, that we weren't taking up arms, we weren't building bombs, we weren't aiding the fighters. It was helping the, uh, you know, the ambulance crews, the emergency rescue. Um, a lot of us took, you know, first aid CPR before we got there. So it was going into a conflict to provide assistance in any way possible um, and to, you know, provide a third party witness um, because, you know, people have this sort of idea that Palestinians are the, the boogie people, the, you know, these scary evil things. And so it's the idea of humanizing it and bringing these personal stories back to people, back to you know, the, the various states and neighborhoods that we came from to help, help people you know, talk to their congresspeople, their senators, with an informed view. Um, and, so, and so as it went, the, uh, the Israelis drove up on us in an armed patrol and basically just opened fire. It was, to me, when I look back at that time, I think, and the, uh, the other thing is that during that time, within the weeks after I was shot, Rachel Corey was killed about two and a half weeks before I was hit. And then in the few weeks after, several other uh, non-US citizens, British citizens, including a BBC journalist, were also shot and killed. And so to me, I think the, the Israelis decided perhaps the Iraq war was going on at that time. Perhaps they thought they had some cover. You know, it was the heat of the, the US war on terrorism. I think they decided to just so, you know, sort of go weapons hot, free fire, and let's send these you know, activists a message and tell them who's boss, and tell the US government who's boss. And, and it seems to be, that's, it's kind of a, a devil's bargain, where the US and Israel see themselves as almost mirror images of each other. They have to, you know, back to back defend each other. And for the US government, it's a question of, how much sort of illegal behavior they will tolerate from the Israeli government. And there's sort of, you know, with Rachel's case and everything, what I found is that there's sort of a ceiling of accountability that the US government will sort of allow. They'll allow the cases to process to a certain point. You know, they want to look busy, they want to look like there's, you know, engaging some accountability. But at a certain point, everybody hits the ceiling and it goes no further. In my case, it was the same way. Um, and so I did have legal trials in Israel. They, they you know, declared themselves not responsible. Basically, it wasn't us, we weren't there. Um, even though the doctor who did the emergency surgery said it was clearly, um, based on the wound, a, a large caliber rifle bullet and a straight shot. 
Um, so, you know, their own doctors were basically contravening them. They didn't, I don't think they even took any testimony from the doctors in the trial. Um, there was a, a civil settlement, a small legal sum. Um, they, their tort laws are very different than ours. Here it's like a Powerball when you get a, a tort suit. But over there it's, um, but, but it certainly helped with some of the medical costs. And they did pay for the cost when I was in the hospital. So they basically financially admitted that they did it. Um, but officially, in no way, shape, or form were they going to do that. Um, and I went over to Israel several times for the legal, legal trials. Um, every time I went in, it was a, I was detained. It was a hassle. I was strip searched. Um, even though I had, I remember going in with a letter from the, the government, the Israeli government, saying this kid's good to go, that my lawyers had arranged, and they still detained me, strip searched, everything. Um, so, yeah, it's a process. And when I, even when I was in the West Bank, um, mostly in the city of Nablus, um, but also some in Janine, uh, myself and several others, we would cross in and out of the West Bank through the Columbia checkpoint into Jerusalem to get books or different things. So, and dealing with the Israeli soldiers in the checkpoints in the West Bank, constant routine, you know, encounters with these soldiers. But never once did they, you know, say, you're under arrest, you got to go, things like that. You can't, you know, let someone into your house and then shoot them and say, well, it's your own fault, you should have known. Um, you know, it's, it's untrue. Um, and so, yeah, the lobbying efforts, um, I think as Maria said, my congressman, David Price, was, he was very good about the sort of constituent services, helping my family get over, uh, helping me a little bit with the legal trials with some back channel sort of how far, how fast is it going. Um, but yeah, they're, you know, they're all kind of a bit wary of doing that. That's been the history. Um, they've all been a little scared because of, I don't know, you know, this, this idea that Israel is so important to U.S. geopolitical military strategy that, yeah, it's, it's kind of, like I said, a devil's bargain. We're going to let them do this stuff, and then at the same time, if we do stuff, they're not going to try to hold us accountable. So um, as far as, you know, BDS, it's ridiculous that a, a government like ours can try to tell us that we can't critique a foreign government's policy. I mean, that's just, that's the most ridiculous, insane thing I've ever heard. Um, and so, you know, whether or not you directly support the BDS movement, to me, it's impossible not to support the right to have that movement, the right to have that opinion that, you know, that Israeli policy, their whole policy structure as far as Palestine really needs to change a lot. Um, and people think they call it an intractable conflict. It's not. Every conflict that they've ever called intractable, like Ireland or Colombia, People have gotten the job done. It just takes the collective will. Um, it takes the collective knowledge for people to get it done. People have to see it as an opportunity, especially in government. You know, senators, congressmen, they have to see it as an opportunity to solve that conflict, to put the work in. Um, and so, you know, for folks like AMP and all the folks in here who still keep the flame lit and try and try and try again, um, I thank you and I commend you for that. And, uh, you know, I've been very proud. I was very proud to go there. Despite what happened, I still have no regrets and I would do it again. Um, and I'm proud to have sort of been, you know, semi-adopted into the, the Palestinian family. Um, and I, you know, I thank everyone, you know, very much over the years for all the support, um, inviting me out to events like this to get a chance to, you know, share the story and, you know, share some community. So, um, I'll just kind of wrap it up like that. As far as, I'll just say as far as the Trump administration, I think it's, you know, the Kushner plan, I think it's just another nothing burger. You know, it's like, it's like when they get in the White House, they, on the instruction manual for president, you know, get your keys, get your badge, and throw out some cookie cutter Israel-Palestine plan. Um, I'd love to be proved wrong, but I can't say I have any confidence that I will, so. Um, but thank you very much, everybody, for coming out today. It's a brilliant audience. Uh, thanks to Ms. Tlaib for showing up. That was really nice. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. You know, I want to remind you, please take the policy papers with you. Uh, take extra copies to give your friends and other people. Take, it would be wonderful if you took one and gave it to your representative and your senators.
All right, next we will go with Emily Siegel. She will tell her story. Emily Siegel is the program director at Eyewitness Palestine, which organizes educational delegations to Palestine, Israel. Emily. Thank you, Jamal and AMP, for putting this together today. Um, I'd like to speak with you both about my own experiences entering through Israeli-controlled borders and also look at the ways in which my experiences differ and why. Over the last decade, I have supported about a thousand American citizens during their entry process through Israeli-controlled borders. Because of this experience, I can confidently state that the ways individuals are treated through the process of entry to Israel is one exhibit of the overarching racist and discriminatory system of oppression that the Israeli government currently enacts on its own citizens, Palestinians living under its military occupation, and travelers from various countries entering through its borders it's con it controls. I begin here because the discussion of issues that US citizens face when entering through Israeli-controlled borders which I will attest to through my own experience as a traveler and in a support role, is a small but important piece of what others who live under the system of a daily oppression routinely experience and to much worse degrees. To begin, it is clear that racial, ethnic, and religious profiling is enacted by the Israeli border authority. It is also clear that those who are disproportionately chosen for additional questioning and interrogation are individuals of Palestinian descent and other travelers with Arab or Muslim backgrounds. Age is another factor in profiling, impacting younger individuals in particular. Additionally, Israeli border agents are looking for individuals who in their eyes look like activists. Most recently, some high-profiled organizers within the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, the BDS movement, have been flagged and questioned upon arrival at the border or even prior to their arrival at the flight check-in desk. Profiled travelers are pulled for additional questioning by the Israeli border authority, who then make a decision of whether to allow them to enter or deny them entry, and if denied, decide if and for how long they are banned from future travel there. To underscore again, these denials of entry disproportionately impact individuals of Palestinian descent who are then denied the opportunity to visit their homeland, families to work or to live. As a white Jewish American woman, I had not been subject to any further questioning at the border during the 20 or so trips I had taken there since I was 16 years old. In fact, in most cases, I was asked no questions at the passport control and upon exit, I was often walked around security scans because such scrutiny was not seen as appropriate for someone like me. This all changed a year ago in April 2018. I arrived at Ben Gurion Airport on my 35th birthday and was greeted by the initial Border Authority agent with a very exuberant happy birthday. That exuberance changed immediately once my passport was scanned into their system. The agent became quiet and typed quickly into her computer. It was apparent to me that my name had been flagged and I was told I would need to go to a waiting room for further questioning. This had never happened to me before. After a 15 minute wait, I was brought into a private room with three Israeli border agents. My additional questioning lasted about 45 minutes. It focused on three main areas. My previous visits to Palestine, Israel, starting in 2000, whether I supported BDS, and questions surrounding individuals and organizations who had planned a trip I had helped organize. The information they were using to question me about, I later learned, had been compiled previously about me by the Israeli Ministry of Strategic Affairs. However, much of the information was completely incorrect, including the claim that I had actually traveled with this trip even though their records clearly stated I was not in the country at that time. And, I somehow, and that I somehow worked for many different organizations, which I don't work for. While one agent did the official questioning, 
Another was yelling at me from time to time that I was lying or saying derogatory remarks about me in Hebrew to the other agents, which my own Hebrew skills allowed me to understand. Meanwhile, the third agent would jump in from time to time and ask questions about information that he had found by searching my name online. After I refused to open my email or unlock my phone, I was told I would be denied entry. I responded that I was happy to continue to answer any of their questions, but I did not feel comfortable allowing anyone into my private accounts or phone. To that, the main agent stood up, yelled in my face that I was lying about all of my answers, took a photo of me and demanded my fingerprints. I was then handed an official document saying that I was being denied entry on two accounts. Illegal immigration concerns, which is funny since I'm Jewish and technically should be able to immigrate there legally, and public safety and security threat. However, I was clearly being denied for my political views and the fact that I organize trips that allow people to see for themselves the current situation and to learn from Palestinian and Israeli peace builders. Encouraging and helping people to see the reality for themselves was deemed a security threat by Israel. Unlike most people who go through this process, I knew what to expect and I knew an Israeli lawyer who could advise me on what to do to make my denial as painless as possible. I contacted her when I returned to the waiting area. I was able to change my return flight to later that evening, which meant I only spent about six hours in an Israeli detention center on the airport grounds. The experience others that I have supported through this process has varied with some similar to mine, while others were much more intense. In some cases, the intimidation tactics used were incredibly severe. Individuals have been fold, pulled aside and held for additional screening, some up to over eight hours, experiencing multiple rounds of questioning and long periods of waiting. During this time, some have been subjected to deeply personal rounds of questions, about their romantic relationships and why their partners would possibly allow them to travel alone, as an example. They have also been yelled at by multiple agents at once, handcuffed to desks or chairs, and even called, as, called terrorists in public waiting areas or privately. When individuals are denied entry, their treatment afterwards has been incredibly intimidating and scary. While some are taken to official detention centers, on airport grounds as I was. Others have been isolated in rooms within the airport alone, and most are given no information about when they will be um, flown back to the US, some waiting up to 24 hours without any official information. Additionally, once they are put on planes back to the US, Israeli officials continue to harass and intimidate them, especially if there is a transfer through another country. During those layovers, some individuals have been held in isolation and not told when their next flights would be. Others have been told that they don't have another flight and that they'd have to purchase their own ticket if they wish to leave, even though a ticket had actually been issued. The majority during these situations are not given back their passports until they reach U.S. soil, creating a vulnerable traveling situation for those in transit. It is, a, it is difficult to support individuals through these experiences and try to assure them that they will actually reach back to the U.S. through such intimidation tactics. For many, it is truly a traumatic experience with long-lasting effects mentally. As a support person, if the traveler upon entry is held for more than a couple hours, I call the U.S. Embassy officials to report that a citizen is currently being held for additional screening. Historically, this has helped put passive pressure on Israeli, Israeli authorities. The embassy officials would contact the border authority office, gain information about why the individual was being held, and stay in contact throughout their questioning, as well as be able to speak with the individual if they were denied entry. However, since 2012, and increasingly since then, we have seen a change. U.S. embassy officials seem unwilling and unable to help individuals who are not Jewish. Specifically asking me the individual's ethnic or religious background and claiming they could do nothing to help if they were not Jewish. Additionally, if they do decide to help, 
Israeli border agents have become increasingly hostile towards U.S. officials when they do call to inquire. U.S. officials have been yelled at by officers and even hung up on. In at least one case, the Israeli officer threw the phone the official had called on towards the individual being questioned, laughed, and basically told them there was no reason that they needed to speak to that official. While my personal entry and denial incident was truly unpleasant, isolating, and demeaning, my entire experience as a traveler pales in comparison to what others have faced during their entry process, specifically those of Palestinian, other Arab, or Muslim backgrounds. And in closing, and to emphasize once more, this mistreatment of US citizens entering through Israeli borders is really just one symptom of the overarching system of oppression that affects the daily realities of those living in Israel, especially as non-white Jewish citizens and those living under protracted military occupation. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Next, we'll hear from Jana Jahad. Jana Jahad began reporting at the age of seven after witnessing the killing of two of her family members by Israeli occupation forces. She claims the title as the youngest press card carrying journalist in the world. She lives in the village of Nevisali in the West Bank. Israel's Ministry of Strategic Affairs named Jana at the age of 11 a grave security threat to the state of Israel. Jana? everyone, my name is Jenna Jihad, I'm 13 years old. I live in Abu Saleh, which is a village of 500 people in Palestine, and I'm the youngest registered press card carrying journalist in the world. So I'm also Palestinian American, so I was born in Florida in Gainesville, but I'm basically treated the same as any Palestinian child who was, poor, who was born in Palestine and is living in the OPT. So I started journalism when I was seven years old, when I realized that there were not enough journalists to cover things that happened in Nabi Saleh and in Palestine in general. Like when my friend Mustafa was killed, my uncle Rushdi was killed, a lot of things were happening and the world didn't know about how we're feeling as Palestinian children living under this military occupation. How we're suffering every single day, how we're getting threatened, intimidated, how we're getting killed, arrested, injured, and during like we're facing a lot of stuff that us as children as like in this world are not supposed to be facing or living and our rights were getting violated and stuff and I believe that I had to be the voice of those children and the voice of those feelings that has to be shared and raised awareness about in this whole international world so um like as we as Oh, he, she, he said um, that um, in last year, actually, um, the Israeli Ministry of Strategic Affairs, they made a secret report about me saying that I'm the next threat on their country just because of me trying to send my message to the whole world and I'm, and I'm basically not doing anything wrong but trying um, to speak about what's happening by reporting. And after that, also, I, you know, the Israeli fourth channel was, um, re they revealed that report. And after that, I got a lot of threats and intimidations from the Israeli street, which is like, oh, here's your school, here's your house, here's your way to school. We're going to kill you, we're going to arrest you, or whatever. And um, they, it, it was pretty, you know, it was pretty traumatizing, you know, for any child to just, like, face any of those messages that are like, oh, we're going to kill you, we're going to arrest you, or anything. And, you know, just thinking... If I was going to get arrested, I'm going to face any single thing that any normal Palestinian child face. For example, when we get arrested, we face a lot of stuff. One of them is interrogation, which we basically get subjected to physical violence, get out of it with sometimes tra traumatized with mental and psychological issues. We um, get like long-term handcuffed, we get blindfolded, we get subjected to solitary confinement which is basically very hard for us as children and is basically violating all of our, like most of our rights as children as and as humans so it was pretty scary for me and after that I coming back from Jordan I was stopped on the border interrogated for three hours and I was only 12 years old in four days you know in the Israeli military law 
It says if you're a Palestinian child, if you're 12 years old and up, you can get arrested, interrogated, treated like a criminal just because of you trying to send your message, just because of you trying to just, you know, defend your land, your house, yourself, your family, your any, anything. And I was stopped and interrogated, asked a lot of questions, and basically I remained my right, my right of silence, which is one of my rights, while well, I was threatened by them. And, uh, you know, as a child under 18, I'm supposed to have a lawyer or one of my parents doing that interrogation, but I didn't have any. And they didn't allow me to have any because my, my rights are getting violated. So that's one of the things that I face as a Palestinian American child living in the OPT. And, uh, you know, like, just I'm not given the freedom of speech, which is basically one of my rights, also my freedom of movement. So every single day, uh, when I wake, like I wake up in a, in a normal child's day, we go to school, and when when I go to school, I face sometimes checkpoints. In my way, there are three checkpoints, and those checkpoints are basically not checkpoints. They're barriers on the streets, and they're also like you know just blocking you from going into that way. So instead of me reaching my school in about 25 to 30 minutes, I have to take another way that takes me about two hours and a half and oh, uh, or like three hours and like there are armed Israeli soldiers on those checkpoints which usually start shooting at us if we even try to you know speak with them or at, just like you know because sometimes there are a lot of patients and my grandma started doing the dialysis so she must sometimes has to go to the hospital a lot of women gave birth to their children on those checkpoints and you know when you even try to speak with them they would start shooting at the car which is like a lot of people got injured because of those incidents and basically um you know us as palestinian children and you know we're living in the west bank it's pretty hard for us because um you know we're like our like it's a discrimination by the law which like for example the israeli children in the um, West Bank, which are living in settlements, illegal settlements, living uh, in only Jewish settlements. Um, they, for example, if they did anything, they go to normal child um, courts, but we go to military courts, which are basically very bad for us, and we're always arrested. Sometimes a lot of children get arrested for even no charges. And, uh, for example, my friend Muhammad, he got, he got arrested last year. Um, for three months without a charge and they usually say oh it's a secret file we cannot show it to you but it's basically it's nothing so there's nothing on you you just get arrested just because of you trying to just send your message or do anything normal as a, any child in this world and also in the West Bank we have those apartheid walls which are basically they claim that they are um, you know for security reasons um, and to just like stuff like that and they say it's only like in, on the border but no, it's in the West Bank. Like, there are sediments around them. There are separation and apartheid walls, which are basically to control more land and which are basically to, you know, enlarge the sediments, to uh, occupy more lands and, and just let a lot of people become refugees. Uh, as also, yeah, uh, two days ago, we had about 120 families. Um, their houses got demolished and they became refugees. So we have a Nakba 2019 again. And a lot of stuff, you know, is are happening. You know, we got, we get restrictions, we get separated, and also, um, you know, we have a lot of issues as Palestinian humans living in the OPT, which are basically like just just the, a very simple um, example is the water. So basically, we have a lot of water resources in Palestine, but it's controlled by this Israeli occupation. So in my village, for example, we only get about 12 hours of running water a week, but the other sediment, which is only 50 meters far from my uh, village, which is only like this thing that separates us is just a, a road, uh, it's basically they get 24 hours of running water, which is basically our water, and uh, they pay less. Electricity, they pay less. Uh, for example, there are roads that are only for settlers, they are only for Israelis, and we cannot go through, so we have to go and take the long ways, which are basically, um, you know, very hard. 
And um, that's why we're trying to raise awareness about what's happening in our lives as Palestinian children. And we always say that we have to find a pathway to justice through accountability and respect the Palestinian rights. And uh, that's why we also have HR 2407. Um, what? Uh, so we have uh, HR 2407, which is a bill, Betty McCollum's bill, No Way to Treat Our Child, because it says that uh, we have to end funding uh, and the USA funding of physical and psychological abuse of children, like, for example, um, you know, detentions, um, getting arrested, getting interrogated, because we really want to live in peace. We really want to live like any other child in this world, like any child deserves to live, to just live uh, a normal life and live uh, in peace, justice, and equality. And that's what we're saying, that we all, the next generations, leader, the leaders of the future, the leaders of today, we all have to unite to make this world a world of peace, a world of love, a world of equality, and to just live a normal life, to just live a normal childhood and be normal children. And again, thank you very much, and I appreciate <laughs> Thank you very much. Next, we want to show you a film about the Awash sisters. And it's a short film. And let me tell you very quickly about them. Nora Awash is a registered nurse in Fairfax, Virginia. And her sister, Safa, is a journalism major at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. My name is Safa Hawash. I'm a student at George Mason University studying communications. Um, I live in Falls Church, Virginia. My name is Noor Hawash. I live in Falls Church, Virginia. I am a nurse. Um, I just recently graduated college. I went to visit Palestine, um, the West Bank, on March 12th at a trip that was a life-changing trip. We, just a normal day, we were visiting Al Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. We were taking our pictures and all of a sudden we heard some noises. We saw some gunshots and then in a matter of seconds the compound was being raided by hundreds of Israeli soldiers. Um, they raided the Aqsa Mosque. They went in, barged the doors, went in with their shoes, kicked people out, physically removed old ladies from the uh, compound. When we were, um, we heard gunshots and we found ourselves in the middle of an attack by Israeli soldiers. Um, and we pulled out our phones obviously to document what was going on, but um, I turned around and I saw my sister and my mother on the ground being handcuffed. Uh, we were beat. Um, I was running back and forth to try to understand what was going on, but every time I ran, I was sort of faced with 10 Israeli soldiers at once, and they were punching, kicking, spitting. Um, we were assaulted, and we weren't just assaulted, we were assaulted in the name of America. My sister pulled out her American passport, and um, she was the soldier that was sitting on top of her handcuffing her. Uh, told her, I don't care about your ID. She picked up her passport and tossed it to the ground. Uh, before I knew it, I was approached by one of the female soldiers when she took my hands, handcuffed me, and threw me to the ground, sat on top of me to successfully handcuff me. Um, my mom, I remember my mom throwing herself at me to try to protect me. She, um, it was a fight or flight situation for her. She knew that she had to do whatever she can, whatever she could to, to protect her daughter, and that's what she did. But I remember her being physically removed, um, thrown to the wall and handcuffed so that no one can come near me. Um, I was barricaded by dozens of soldiers. Their feet were on my body, on my back, on my face, um, trying to keep me down as the female soldier sat on me and um, tried to handcuff me. At that moment, I sort of sort of understood a notion that I had only been reading and watching about in the news. Um, I thought that my sister had pulled out her passport, we were all good, but it was completely the opposite because it was at that moment that I realized that if you don't fit the mold, of, if you don't look American enough, if you don't fit that mold that we're sort of taught to look like, then you, you're not treated like an American. Um, thank you American Muslims for Palestine. Thank you so much.